go right ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Curtis Rogers, Communications Director at the South Carolina State Library, and I'd like to welcome everyone to Library Social Media for Beginners. Um, we've also got a few other presenters today, Ellen Dunn, who is our Public Information Coordinator, and Dana Carlston, who is our graphic designer, and they're waving. Um, but um, uh, thank you all for joining us. Again, uh, this session is recorded, so folks who are um, registered but maybe not able to join us will be able to watch this later. Uh, I think we'll end up putting it on our YouTube channel, so hopefully folks can see more there. Um, I've got a series of some slides, and uh, as you can see, I'm just now kind of giving a little social uh, media session overview. Um, and just to let you know how the session is going to work today, even though we say we're going till 12, we probably will not go to 12 unless we have a lot of questions, which is certainly fine. Um, please feel free to ask all kinds of questions. Um, if you uh, do want to ask a question during the middle of a presentation, please go ahead and put it in the chat. And Tiffany, uh, we'll be paying attention to our chat as we go along and uh, can uh, ask uh, presenters your question as we go along, if you'd like to do that, or if you'd like to wait till the very end um, and ask a question in the chat or unmute yourself, that's certainly fine too. Um, so I'm gonna be concentrating on kind of doing some general social media um, talking points, and then I will take a closer look at Facebook. Um, Ellen is going to be working with Twitter and Dana is going to be working with Instagram. So hopefully you'll get a lot of tips. And by the way, uh, I, I'll just speak for myself. I am not an expert on Facebook. I've just been doing it for a long time. There are some things that I do use regularly, some things that I have never used and may not ever use. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not at all a, uh, an expert and some of you may have some other points that you uh, know may work better. And so certainly feel free to share those in the chat. We're always uh, looking to learn and hopefully um, figure things out as we go along. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go on with uh, just kind of a general overview of getting started with social media. Uh, kind of some of the things that you want to think through as you embark on getting started with social media. Um, I know some of you are already working in social media and we've also got some folks from different types of libraries and also from outside of libraries. Um, so we're gonna basically be talking about how libraries can be using social media, but of course it, a, lot of, a lot of the information that we are sharing does carry over to other kinds of organizations or um, government organizations. So. Um, hopefully some of this will translate to what you do or what you're thinking about doing with social media. Um, one of the first things you have to do, and I have a more detailed slide in a, a few more slides about this, but you have to figure out what you want to get out of social media. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a couple of slides. Um, you also want to think about how many social media profiles you want to manage. Um, are you going to have a, an account or a Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter for each separate library branch? Or if you're a literacy or a government agency organization or work at a, you know, an academic library or a public school, um, how many different things do you want to manage? Um, for instance, at the South Carolina State Library, we have uh, three Facebook pages that are for major programs. So we have our general South Carolina State Library Facebook page, then we have a Facebook page for our Discus program, and then for our Talking Book Services program. We used to actually have a lot more than that, and it got out of hand. Um, and some libraries I know have gone through that kind of um, herding cats, it's really difficult to do. But um, a lot of organizations, probably within the last two, three, four years, started scaling back their social media because a lot of times it can get out of hand, uh, can be unwieldy. 
Um, so if you're getting started, think about just keeping it simple. Maybe just start with, you know, a Facebook, a Twitter, an Instagram, just one of each or, or just one of those, uh, just so that you can get a feel for how it works. Um, and you also have to think about what social media services will work best for your library. So you have to um, know what, what your community wants to get out of social media and maybe things that people are already saying on social media about your library or your organization. Um, one of the good things, one of the things to do that's a good idea at the start is to look on social media for your organization. Uh, I was helping a public library years ago getting started with social media and they didn't have a Facebook account, but someone in their community went ahead and created a Facebook page for them that they didn't know about. So what you need to do is uh, look closely within the social media outlet that you're interested in starting and um, look and see what's already there. You, you may need to um, put out a social media um, account and you might want to describe it as the official Facebook page for Anytown Public Library. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things to think about when you're getting started. Uh, like I said, you also have to know your community. You have to know, are you an academic library? And you know, most of your students are going to be on Instagram. So is Instagram something you want to focus on? Uh, also, if you're an academic library, are your faculty and staff mostly going to be on Facebook? So if you have a Facebook page and an Instagram account, you have to know who are of your audience and your community, uh, who's going to be the consumer of that information. And conversely, how you're putting that information out and putting that information together is important to think about. And then lastly, you also want to be sure and be an active contributor. Um, one of the things sometimes I forget to do is post to our Facebook page and I think, oh, I've got to do something today or I've got to do at least three or four more things. Um, and, you know, you can, uh, if, if you're really good at scheduling, you can, you can use some kind of online scheduler. Um, you can schedule your posts ahead of time. So if you want to do one a day and you want to work on them all on Monday, so that you don't have to think about it the rest of the week, that's something that you can do. Um, so you have to know all the, the tips and tricks and tools that are out there that can help you um, be very successful with social media. So one of the things I wanna talk about um, just a little bit is a kind of a quick overview of the history of social media. Um, going all the way back to 2002, you see there's Friendster and this is just a timeline image that shows a lot of different icons. But you can see in 2004, or actually 2003, that's MySpace and LinkedIn. And a lot of these icons, I really don't even know what they are. So <laughs> um, 2004, you can see that's when Facebook and Flickr started, also Yelp. And 2005, you see YouTube and also Yahoo buys Flickr. And Flickr, if you aren't aware, is a uh, image and photo sharing um, social media tool. Um, 2006, you can see that Facebook opens to the public. So it went two years without actually opening to the public. It was mostly a college and university social media site. And also 2006, you've got Twitter uh, coming onto the scene. And 2007 is Tumblr. And 2009 is Foursquare, and that's actually something that I used to use a lot, and then it kind of fell by the wayside. 2010, you see Instagram, and 2011, you see Pinterest and Google+. Interesting thing about those two is that Pinterest is still around and Google+, Plus is not. Um, we used to have a Google+, Plus page for the State Library, and that went away. So sometimes you have to think these things come and go. Um, who knows if Twitter and Instagram and Facebook will be here next year. 
So you have to think about, um, you know, those kinds of things to plan ahead. Um, in 2012, there were a lot of purchases. So you can see Facebook bought Instagram, Twitter bought Vine, and Vine is not around anymore. Um, you can see that Yahoo buys Tumblr, and then MySpace actually had a relaunch in 2012. Um, 2013, uh, Vine is there, and um, then 2014, Foursquare kind of comes back. Um, and then you see later on, 2016, TikTok uh, started and is now, four years later, very popular. So uh, just some kind of things to think about when you're thinking back over the history of social media so that you can kind of get an idea how things come and go. Okay, so what do you want to get out of social media for your library or for your organization or um, agency? Um, there are a lot of things that you probably do want to get out of it, and these are some things to think about. Um, event promotion. That's really, really important when, especially now that we're in the situation we are with COVID-19 and quarantining, um, you not only want to prevent, you not only want to promote events um, online, but you want to do them online. And a lot of people and organizations are doing all of their events online. So what better way to promote them? Um, also, you may want to have a lot more uh, patron interaction. Uh, again, with COVID-19, you're uh, not really able to do a lot of face-to-face -face if you've, your library has reopened or if your organization has reopened. And so being able to interact through social media is a great way to be able to communicate with your um, library patrons. Uh, also, you can communicate internally. Um, there is something that we have at the South Carolina State Library and it is called Slack, S-L-A, is it C-K? Yes, S-L-A-C-K. Um, and so that's a kind of a social media um, account that we're using pretty much just for our own staff. So you can use social media just to create staff awareness. If everyone on your staff is on Facebook, then maybe you wanna have a private group that's just for staff where you can actually share documents. Um, and, uh, and, you know, share information online. Also, um, book discussions. This is something that you can use social media for, um, and that is to actually uh, create groups or, or pages so that you can have active book discussions with your library patrons. You also might have certain special services that you want to promote and that's something that you can do in social media. And another great thing, especially again, now that we're in the life of quarantining, um, is live streaming of events and programs. So if you have someone who is doing a summer reading program, or if you have an author who's going to be doing an author talk, you can live stream those uh, over social media. And that way you can get more interaction with, with your library patrons. Um, you can also promote partners and other kinds of community events. For instance, we had an event uh, last night that we were co-hosts on with uh, the Georgia Center for the Book. And so I had been looking through Facebook and our Facebook page and noticed that the uh, Georgia Center for the Book had listed us as a co-host. And so Facebook asked me, are you in fact a co-host of this? And I clicked on yes, so that uh, online for that program, it would show that not only the Georgia Center for the Book was a host, but also the South Carolina Center for the Book. Um, you can also use social media as a reference chat service. Um, there are lots of different programs you can use. There are lots of different things out there that people are on, uh, for instance, like Kick. Uh, that's kind of a social media chat service. Also, you can use Facebook Instant Messenger. People can message reference questions to your library that way. Um, I know at the State Library, we get 
messages through all different kinds of social media. So it's just something that we all have to pay close attention to. One of the other things I want to make you aware of is that we have a guide on um, social media in libraries, and I'm not going to click on it and go to it now, but you can see the URL is right here on this page. And actually, if someone can put that in the chat, that would allow people to click on that. Um, and that's just the one of the guides that we have. Uh, it's a libguide at the State Library that um, focuses on a lot of different social media accounts at libraries in South Carolina and also some different kinds of social media resources that are available. So I um, highly recommend that folks check out that LibGuide, that social media in libraries. You can also Google it, just South Carolina State Library social media, and uh, you'll probably come up with it there. So check that out when you get a chance. And this is a kind of a interesting thing to have to talk about. And that is talking about your social media policy. One of the things that I've always recommended is that every library or every any organization actually that works with social media have an official social media policy. You can see this ours is just front and back of a page. So it's just two pages. It doesn't have to be really, really involved. But you can see this is something that was approved by our Board of Trustees. Um, and I did, I think I rewrote a little part of it. So in October of 2018, it was reapproved, but we had already had a social media policy up to that point as well. But some of the things that I want to focus on in a social media policy for your library or your organization, one thing to talk about is that is how you will react to comments. Um, I know some of the times, uh, especially depending on what your organization or, you know, where your library is and how active your community is, you may get a ton of comments, you may get very few comments. Um, but it's something that is important to go ahead and address up front. So you can see here, and I'll read this on, from this image, um, item number four that we have on the front of our social media policy says, some social media sites allow user comments. The State Library will consider carefully whether to allow comments before launching a social media initiative. However, if comments are allowed, user feedback should remain regardless of whether or not it is favorable to the agency. Comments will be deleted only if they are offensive, abusive, racially inflammatory, threatening, or clearly off topic. Comments that endorse a political candidate, party, or commercial product will be deleted. So just speaking from the Facebook uh, side of social media, what we do at the State Library, there have been very few times I've had to delete uh, comments or posts. So maybe only about four times. And I think we've had, you know, a Facebook page probably for eight, nine years, maybe 10 even. Um, so it has not happened a lot. Um, one of the things that you can do is treat any kind of comments on social media just as a regular customer service response. You know, if someone is complaining about something, use that as an opportunity to address it, not only with your staff, but also um, with the uh, patron or the customer. So, you know, just use the same philosophy you would uh, with customer service. You know, you can kill them with kindness and apologize and, you know, refer to how, uh, what your policy states on whatever issue it might be. But always think about the comment aspect because, you know, you might get things that are really objectionable and, you know, would they fall into an offensive, abusive, uh, inflammatory kind of category? And is it something that you would need to delete? And um, that's also where kind of, you know, internal committee comes in handy. If you um, uh, have two or three or four people who help help out with social media, like we do at the State Library, we actually have a number of staff who work on social media, uh, not only just Ellen and Dana and I, but we have 
um, a couple of staff in the Discus uh, statewide virtual library program who work on their social media. Um, we have a couple of staff in Talking Book Services who work on their social media. So it's important that, you know, you kind of have an internal group that you can discuss these things with. So um, then on, on the other page, you can see I've got a few kinds of things that we address for our internal staff. And this is something that's important for your internal staff. And one thing is uh, never use a reference your formal position when writing in a non-official capacity. So in other words, don't use your own, your official work email to establish a private social media account. Um, so that's something to think about when you're, you're dealing with uh, staff members at your, your library or your organization. Um, and number seven on that uh, second page of our uh, policy, I really have to keep that in mind, and that is always pause before posting. Do not publish information in haste or without thinking carefully about the impact of the statement you are about to make. Um, and that's always that's a good idea to do, you know, with work and in your personal social media habits. Um, also, to others online, there is no clear distinction between your work life and your personal life, and always be honest and respectful in both capacities. So. You know, there are people who have been fired over things they have posted on social media. And, you know, that's why, again, always pause before posting. Make sure you're also in the, the correct account. Um, I remember there was a, per, a staff member, a state government employee, who uh, managed a social media, I think it was a Twitter account for the Department of Health Environmental Control in South Carolina and posted something very political, very derogatory, and unfortunately was signed into the wrong account. It was not that person's personal account, it was the agency's uh, Twitter account. And so the next day that person was no longer working there. Um, so again, always po pause before posting, just really important. You can also find this, um, our state library policy online uh, the URL is right there. It's quite long. However, you can just Google South Carolina State Library Social Media Policy and you should come up with that. Okay, another thing that I wanted to chat briefly about is <clears throat> once you make a social media account for your library or your organization, not everybody is going to immediately jump on it and follow it and like it. Um, you have to cross promote your social media sites. And one thing I've always recommended is integrate them into your library or your organization's website. And you will see a lot of uh, websites that point to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, LinkedIn, what, if you have a podcast, if you're using Flickr, any other kinds of things. And this is uh, an image on the screen that shows uh, this is in the footer of every single page at the State Library that you go to um, because we want people to follow us on social media and all the different outlets that we have in social media. One thing you'll notice at the very bottom of this screen is the Pinterest icon. We have a Pinterest account, but we don't necessarily promote it on our pages. Um, it's something that has kind of not fallen by the wayside because a lot of people still use Pinterest, but it's not something that we've been actively updating. So we kind of just removed it from our list of um, social media links on the bottom of our website. So think about if you're creating a new social media account for your library or your organization, how you're going to integrate that on your website. Um, some Organizations put it up on the, uh, you know, upper right-hand corner. Um, some organizations have it in the footer of their website. So it just depends. And you also want to think about other ways that you can share your social media links. And one of the things that we do at the State Library, and Ellen may talk with, about this later, but uh, since she is our public information coordinator, Every week she sends out a weekly email marketing update and also has a monthly e-newsletter. And so 
in those on Constant Contact, which is our email marketing system, um, at the bottom of every page, we also have links to our main social media accounts. So that's another way that you can remind folks um, how to find you on social media. So you can see also in this image, I have um, some links to, or, or just uh, some information about our Facebook pages. And so we've got South Carolina State Library is our main Facebook page. Then we have a Discus, South Carolina's virtual library page. And then we have uh, the South Carolina State Library's Talking Book Services uh, Facebook page. And you can see that first number is a rating. So uh, we've got some pretty good ratings uh, from our followers. And one of the things that you'll always notice in social media is that you have a lot of statistics. And so one thing we do in our monthly report is always kind of take a look at our statistics, what's working, um, and things that may, maybe we need to think about changing. Uh, and that's how uh, social media statistics can play a part in how you manage your social media. Okay, so one of the questions I always get asked is, is it free? And this, by the way, is a picture of my dog, Chloe, who is now 12, and she is a rescue pit bull mix and she was free. She showed up on the front porch and, you know, we love her to death, but social media is free just like a new dog or a new cat that is free. You still have to feed them, water them, care for them, um, you know, take them to the vet, which costs a lot. So the same thing is like social media. Yes, it's free, but you have to think about, is this gonna be someone's full-time job? Is this going to be distributed among different staff? Um, are we gonna do any paid advertising? Um, so that kind of analogy of, you know, yes, it's a lot of it is free, but it's kind of free like a, a free dog, free puppy or a kitten. So think of it in those terms. So a little bit of overview just for Facebook. <clears throat> and let me get some, some water. So <clears throat> some of the pros of uh, Facebook, you can definitely keep in touch with patrons. You can share a lot of your library resources and you can also treat it as a virtual business card, which I like to think of social media as a virtual business card. Um, some of the cons, the settings can be complicated. It can be time consuming. Advertising management can be complicated. Um, so you have to think about those as well. Um, interacting in groups, I think is wonderful. I'm gonna show you something shortly. Um, you can promote your library collection in various hobby groups and be, be very specific. You can share information in professional groups like how to find a job, you can also provide educational resources, which is very good because there are a lot of active groups on Facebook that are for different kinds of educational um, activities. It's very easy to sign up. Just go to facebook.com slash reg and follow all those instructions and think about whether or not you're using, you know, a work email address how you want to set up that account for your organization because a lot of times it can be seamless with you know personal life versus professional life. Um, Facebook can be challenging that way. Um, this is a picture that I came across in our online digital collections of uh, photographs and this was a post that I shared May 28th um, and hashtag TBT that's the throwback Thursday. Um, also using hashtags can be important, not so much in Facebook, but more so in Instagram and, um, and Twitter. But you can see I, I just said here, who is this getting on the Greenwood South Carolina bookmobile in 1956 with some, you know, information and a link to the online uh, digital collection. So if someone wanted to uh, zoom in and, and look at that more closely, they certainly could. And within about 10 minutes, I was really surprised because I saw 
that after I posted this in the Exploring South Carolina and its History group on Facebook, because like I said, it's important to share these things in uh, numerous areas, this woman replied and said, that's my mother uh, as the librarian. And so I was like, wow, really, that's cool. I've never had any, someone you know, respond so quickly. And she also said that she shared it with her brother. So it was kind of neat. And you know, it may not be that she's ever a walk-in patron of the South Carolina State Library, but you know, one of my goals as a communications person is to make sure people know we exist. Um, and so you know, having her uh, and then see the, the image with her mom and an image that she had never seen before, and then sharing it with her brothers, you know, that's more people who know the South Carolina State Library is there and, and kind of what we do. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention is Facebook Business Manager. You can go there. It's kind of complicated. There's lots of training out there. It's business.facebook.com and it helps you manage paid ads. So if you're going to do any paid advertising um, and it also is really effective for keeping your personal and professional interactions very separate because essentially it's a different website that you go to, but um, definitely you can check that out. I don't use it that much because I don't do a lot of paid advertising on Facebook, uh, but when I do, it helps me manage that. And then lastly, I just wanted to show you uh, in a few slides what our uh, Facebook main pages look like. Uh, so you can see here is the main page for the South Carolina State Library. And by the way, if you're not a uh, follower of ours, please find us on Facebook and uh, give us a like. Um, but you can see as I'm logged in from uh, a Facebook administrator standpoint, you can see here I can view as a visitor um, if I want to see how it looks like to anyone else. But you can see I can create a post. I can see uh, for the last 28 days what how many people I reached, how many post engagements there were how many page likes we had. Um, so, and I can also change the images on here and uh, I can also create events. There's, I can go live if I want to, lots of things that you can do. Um, and this is just a quick look at our Discus South Carolina's Virtual Library Facebook page. And also, and lastly, I think this is my last slide, is our State Library Talking Book Services uh, page. So lots of interesting things you can do with Facebook. And I would just um, say kind of as I wrap up, you know, feel free to contact any of us. A lot of us work on Facebook at the State Library. Um, but feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to chat with you more about what you do with Facebook. And, um, and it looks like a question came in. I noticed you were personally identified in that picture chat, guidance on anonymity versus being named. Um, yes, because I had posted, I had shared that to a group that I was personally a member of, so then it showed up that I was responding as myself. Um, there is a way that you can subscribe to a group from the page, and um, I had done that, but I didn't switch my accounts. I wasn't that concerned about it, but if you're concerned about it, there's a little pull down uh, option next to uh, how you're logged in and you can switch that to your Facebook page so that, so that it would have shown up uh, as being just from the state library. Um, sometimes I'm really bad about doing that. Um, so I just went ahead, I was too excited. So I went ahead and responded as myself. But um, yeah, that's definitely something that you can switch. Uh, you just have to be really cognizant of, of when you're doing those comments. Any other questions while I'm still um, here before we turn it over to Ellen? Um, you can also go ahead and type those in at any time and I can respond to those as we're continuing the program. But otherwise, I think we'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Ellen. And let's see, I wonder, um, Tiffany, are you able to make Ellen a co-host? I certainly can. All right. So Let's thanks, see. everybody. And Ellen, if you'd like to just um, share your screen or whatever you've got for us, it's all you. You're muted.
You're muted. Okay. There you go. There okay. we are. Okay, fabulous. All right. Well, let me get this rolling here. And I, it's funny, I have two screens. And so I'm always confused as to which screen will get shown. So I'm going to hit share screen now. And um, let's see how we do here. All right. Can y'all see my screen? Looks good. Okay, wonderful. Then we're in the right place. Well, first of all, I want to say good morning and thank you all so much for being here. Like Curtis said, my name is Ellen Dunn. I am the public information coordinator at the State Library and I manage our Twitter account. And so today I'm going to be focusing on Twitter, some of the things that you can use to help get your campaigns or your information or whatever you have going on at your library out to your patrons and just the community in general because Twitter helps to introduce you into a large audience. So we'll talk about tweets as you've heard, a few tips and tricks that help you to use this mass messaging tool that really does have worldwide potential and we will get into that worldwide potential in a few minutes because you'll be amazed how far your tweets truly can go. So what are you going to get out of it today? My goal is to just ease you in with a little bit of history just to talk about where Twitter came from and where we think it's going uh, and also talk about why Twitter has an edge, what it can do for you and what kind of potential it has for your library or your organization. Like Curtis mentioned, tags and hashtags are major players in Twitter because they help to engage you into a worldwide audience and they help to place you in conversations that otherwise you may not normally be in. And they also help to bring attention to your brand. So if you are able to successfully navigate tags and hashtags, it can be to your benefit. Uh, we want to create content that people want. And sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge because we may think we know what our audience wants and we may think we know what they're looking for, but indeed it could be totally different. So we will kind of go off the beaten path and look into some of the things that your audience is enjoying on your page, or I'll use our page as an example, but then kind of dive into how we can make the most out of that. And that will help to increase engagement. And analytics come into that because the data will definitely tell you the story of what's going on with your brand on Twitter and what people desire from your brand. And it's funny because when I first heard the term analytics, I thought, oh my goodness, I am not a math person. I am not a, a strategy person. What am I going to do with this? But it's really a lot easier than you think. And so I'll show you exactly how simple it can be. So Twitter has definitely come a long way since its inception in March of 2006. It started really as a short messaging service to send texts. So if you think about your group chats that you have, that's really the origination of Twitter. It started out in that way so that you could send information to a group of people who were focused on a similar topic, a similar issue and communicate with those people. And so that was how they exchanged information and it was little short bursts of content. You probably know that the character limit is shorter on Twitter than would be on Facebook or there's no character limit on Facebook. And those character limits have grown, um, but you are limited in what you can say. So sometimes you have to get really creative and we'll go through some strategies on how to do that here in just a few minutes. So the question is, where do we think Twitter is going? Well, just like anything, videos are taking over. Everyone loves videos. And we may think in the beginning, okay, well, I can just put a video of anything on there. The key to increasing your engagement when it comes to video is you wanna make sure that in those first 10 seconds, you are really grabbing people because the analytics show that generally most people will only watch those first 10 seconds of your video. 
If you get lucky, they will continue to watch on for maybe 60 seconds, but if you don't grab them in those first 10 seconds, you're done and they will move on to another post. So make sure that that first little bit of information or first bit of content in that video is, is really good. Um, I love Twitter because it brings us to people who are all over the world. And it gives us that opportunity to talk with people, to converse with people, to exchange ideas in ways that we never thought possible before because we always thought we needed to know these people. So we have that opportunity. And it's a major player, whether you like it or not, in how people get their news. Some people do not watch news like they used to. Back in the old days, you know, there were the big three networks. Well, then cable news came along and now we have social media and some people only get their news from social media. So Twitter nowadays is kind of guiding reporting a little bit because not only are people getting their news from there, but also news organizations are worried about what kind of outcry will happen on Twitter based on what they're publishing. So that's just a little nuts and bolts, but let's talk about what Twitter means for you because that's the main reason why you attended this morning. So this is what we call the basic equation. And in Twitter terms, it's Twitter equals speed plus influence. Twitter is a way to quickly get information out to a group of people and influence what they're thinking about your brand. And so that's why we use Twitter. It's short, it's fast, it's to the point, and that's how we get people involved. So if you've used Twitter before, you know this. If you haven't, it's good news. Twitter is extremely easy to sign up for. You go to twitter.com and you follow the prompts. It's that easy, it's that simple. Towards the end of our talk, we'll go into a few things that are a little bit more complicated like TweetDeck and the analytics page. But when you're first starting out, Take baby steps and only do what you know. And then eventually as you work in it a little bit more, you'll get more comfortable with those other things, but start small, create your account and start posting. And where you're going to get the most bang for your buck is the tag and the hashtag. So we're gonna do a little case study with something that we had going on here at the South Carolina State Library. And that is something called the Faces of Margaretin. This photo was taken in the Netherlands by the gentleman who is on the right, the dad, and he has these two little boys. And in the Netherlands, it is a big deal to adopt a grave in the Margaretin Cemetery. The Margaretin Cemetery is the only American military cemetery in the Netherlands. And so these people look forward to the opportunity to adopt a grave. They take it very seriously and they consider it an honor. And in fact, you have to become part of a waiting list in order to adopt a grave. So this gentleman on the right finally was able to adopt a grave of a soldier from Dillon, South Carolina, Private First Class James E. Wise. And that is his grave right there. And they go out to the cemetery and they take care of it regularly. You see them putting some flowers on the grave. Well, every year at the Margaretin Cemetery, they have a large celebration to honor the soldiers who were buried there. And one of the things that they like to do is they like to have a picture and some information about each soldier so that we're able to add some individualism to all of these white crosses. And so this man reached out to one of our reference librarians and he said, hey, can you find some information on private first class wise? And we said, sure, no problem. So our reference librarians are brilliant at what they do and they started digging into our archives. But we decided in the communications department to do what we know. So we said, okay, we're gonna jump onto social media and see what happens. And so I posted these two posts within five days of one another, basically asking our followers to see if they know anything about this person. Because we look to people all over the state and you never know who knows who. So that's kind of what the first tweet, the one on the left was. It was saying, if you know anything about private first class James E. Wise from Dillon County, 
please let us know. And then it started to gain some traction. And, and as the days went on, I thought, okay, wait a minute. What if we kind of went out beyond our scope of followers? And let's look into some tags and some hashtags that we could jump onto to see if we can get more people who are willing to jump into this conversation. So I went on Twitter and I looked for things having to do with Margaret and Cemetery. And that's where you see there on the right hand side, um, the first blue at the end of the tweet, it's at DGV Margaretin. Now, you'll see in a minute that that is a, a Dutch name that I'm not even going to try and pronounce because I'll butcher it. But that is the actual Twitter account of that cemetery. So there are people who follow that cemetery. So I tagged them. The way you tag them is you search them and then you can look for whatever comes up. And that's how you can find out what their name is on Twitter, what their Twitter handle is, if you will. And I also looked into a few other things, um, the, uh, M the American Embassy in the Netherlands and anything that I could think of. And that's what those other tags are and other organizations that look to honor the military from World War II over in the Netherlands. And then that brings us to that last, ha last hashtag, alone together we honor. And if you notice, I capitalize the first letter of each one of those words. And the reason why I do that is not only is it easier to read, but also for those of you who have blind or visually impaired patrons, their screen readers will be able to pick up on that. Otherwise, it's going to sound like just a big you know, mess that they can't understand. But if you cap capitalize that, it's called camelbacking then they'll be able to hear that from their screen reader, which makes you more accessible to all of your patrons. And, and that's very important for libraries because we service everyone. So we got really lucky because the Margaretin face, uh, Twitter group, rather, they saw it and yay, this is great. And they were excited. So they responded back to me on Twitter and, and think about this is all the way across the world. And they said, we are looking for more information on some other soldiers who are from the state of South Carolina because we wanna honor those people as well. Would you be willing to help us? And I said, absolutely. And that's when I decided to take it off Twitter. You see down there, I gave them my personal email address to send me the names of these 32 heroes so that we could investigate them. But Twitter started the conversation. And had I not had Twitter, I never would have connected with these people. And we would have not had the opportunity to honor these soldiers who so deserve it and help these people in the Netherlands. So we are giving ourselves a global presence. And the only way we were able to do that was through Twitter. So that's our first case study, looking at those tags and those hashtags and exactly what they can do for us. So let's look into another one. And this one has to do more with creating content and encouraging engagement. And so if you have been by our building lately, you will notice that our gorgeous lions out front, Saul and Edgar, have masks. And one of our retired librarians made those masks for the lions and we were so excited. So Curtis put the information on Facebook and Dana put it on Instagram and I put it on Twitter. And I looked for tags and hashtags that had to do with the mask conversation because I thought this can enter me into what's going on, not only in Columbia, but also all across the state and even possibly across the country, but I really wanted to just focus on South Carolina and Columbia. So this is our tweet and it talks about how Saul and Edgar, and that's our hashtag for them, are complying with the city of Columbia. So I tagged the city of Columbia, figuring that people follow that. So we get more eyeballs on our tweet and also tagged Mayor Benjamin from the city of Columbia and I also used some other tags and hashtags that I researched that had to do with things happening in the Columbia area and people. And, and so I just thought, how can I get the most bang for my buck? And that's what I did. And if you see there on the bottom, I was thrilled to see that we had 70 likes 
and 15 retweets. And I'll show you how to see who retweets your information as we get closer to the end. But right now, I'm going to tell you, that's big for us. And we were super excited. And I had more fun watching the likes and the retweets come in. And so you may think, okay, well, how do I get there? How did they do it? What works? So we're going to go over how we did it. So you need to put yourself in that conversation. And the way you do that is you research what people are talking about on Twitter, and then you wanna mention them. And you use that tag. I saw that We Are Columbia was trending. I saw that at Columbia SC had a lot of followers. Obviously, Real Columbia SC, that hashtag was doing well. And the mayor, there are plenty of people who follow the mayor. So I knew I had a chance to gain some ground if I added those tags and hashtags. You want to make sure that any of the hashtags that you use are appropriate. It's a simple thing to do. You go in the search bar, you type it in, and then you're going to know what's coming up. Because sometimes you may think this is completely innocent, but it may not be. And you don't want to use a tag or a hashtag for something that's controversial, because like Curtis said earlier, that could get you into some trouble. And then you may have a campaign that's going on that you want to create some conversation about. So you can create your own hashtag. And that's what we did there with Saul and Edgar. We've done it with our bookmark contest or our letters about literature contest. And that helps you to start your own conversation. And you can watch it and see if it's picking up steam. And, and you can also throw out some little, little baits to try and get more people to use that hashtag in different tweets and things like that. So the other thing that's very important is you want to watch what is going on with your action on Twitter. So I saw that Leland Pinder, who's the morning anchor for WIS television here in Columbia, had retweeted our tweet about the mask. And I thought, okay, this is good. Leland has plenty of followers. So not only am I going to write a tweet that tags Leland, but I'm also gonna kind of push the needle a little bit and see if maybe I can prompt him or WIS to come across the street and take some video of our masked lions. That did not happen, but what did happen was our darling friends at News 19 did. And so you see Julia Kaufman had tweeted that the lion statues are doing their part to stop the spread of COVID-19. And so when I saw that, I thought, okay, I definitely need to get into that action. So we thanked her. We were very grateful. And so I tagged her in the thank, thank you, because the more conversation you have, the more your conversations and your posts are going to come up in the feeds of people who are following you or the people who are following that hashtag. So we always use the term reply, 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 because it's gonna keep that conversation going. You wanna prompt them to take action. That's what I did with Leland there. I asked him, please come and take video of our lions. We'd love it. They wanna show off their new swag. And that keeps the conversation going. And like we said, that replying, that keeping it going, keeping yourself talking about it. So I am actually going to see here if I can exit out of my PowerPoint for a second and come on over to something called um, TweetDeck. And TweetDeck, when I first learned about it, I thought, um, okay, let me make sure I can get it on here. Dana, I can see you. Can you see TweetDeck on the screen? You can. Okay, fabulous. All right, good deal. Thanks for the thumbs up. Okay, so you simply go to tweetdeck.twitter.com. And when it comes out, at first you take taken aback, as I like to say, because you think, oh my goodness, there's so much information out here. What am I going to do? Guess what? I only want you to focus on um, this column where I'm going up and down, right here, where you see these two gentlemen. Because this is going to show you who likes your posts, who's retweeting your posts, who's following you, what's happening. And you can move these columns around 
if what's on the left is really distracting, don't worry about it, move it around so you don't see it. But this gives you an idea of what kind of conversation is happening. And this is when I saw the people who were retweeting our mask tweets. And I even saw that's when the mayor liked it and, and retweeted it, which was great. Over here on the left, you can actually schedule tweets. So let's say um, tomorrow I know I'm going to be really busy and I don't have time to tweet. I can go ahead and put it in there, schedule it. It's very simple. And then you are able to not have to worry about it. So that's another little trick there that, that works really well and helps you out. So that's called TweetDeck. It's um, very simple and all you have to do is go to TweetDeck and you're good to dip, go. You're gonna hear my, my cat in the background. I apologize, that's Rufus. He loves attention, so he meows a lot when he brings me his toy. So <laughs> he'll eventually get over that he's not getting attention. All right, so we talked about the different things having to do with the conversation. So now, what tells the story? The data tells the story. And don't let data scare you. Data is your friend. So simple website that you need to remember is analytics.twitter.com. And if you have an account, you're going to be able to see what is happening with your Twitter account through analytics.twitter.com. And so once you get there, you are going to see everything that's happening on your page. And it's going to show you what tweet is doing really, really well. Um, who has, okay, thank you, Rufus. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, oh, now he's coming over to my desk. Great. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to be able to see what tweet is doing really well. Who has the most engagement? Who's following you? And then down here, which media tweets are doing the best? We had to say that unfortunately somebody took the masks off and I tweeted that out. I'm happy to say, woohoo, that the masks were found and all is well. But that's where all of your analytics are. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what is happening with your content and what's going on. So, I want to go ahead and just thank everybody for their attendance and, and for their ear. And this is my contact information. And if you need anything, I am here. And if I don't know the answer, I will find somebody who does. And I'm going to turn it over to Dana so that I can go make Rufus quiet. And I want to thank everybody for their time and their patience. Thanks, Ellen. And thanks, Curtis. Um, and I will now try to get my screen up. I think it's, that's now Zoom etiquette, isn't it? It's like, let me narrate as I figure out what I'm doing. Okay, share screen, here we are. And I apologize for looking up <laughs> to the heavens as I'm speaking. My, my camera is at the bottom of my monitor. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fun time. But um, yeah, my name is Dana. Uh, I'm the graphic designer at uh, South Carolina State Library. Um, and I run the uh, Instagram account for the library. So I'm just gonna kind of walk you through what Instagram is all about, especially if you haven't uh, you know, ever worked with it before, you'll kind of get to take a look at what it looks like um, when you're actually using it. Uh, I also, I, can't do anything easy, you know, I always have to make things a little bit more complicated. So I have embedded a bunch of uh, videos in my uh, PowerPoint. So I'm hoping that it'll work. We'll find out. Um, holler if it doesn't, please let me know. Okay. Uh, but Instagram is going to be the same idea as Twitter. Uh, but instead of, you know, being able to just post a, sen a sentence, if you want, you have to post a photo or a video. Um, so it's really emphasizing those photos and videos. Think of it as just a big online photo album, really. Um, so, you know, when you open up Instagram, let's see if this plays, you can open it up. You've got a, a big old timeline kind of right in the beginning where you can scroll through and see what, you know, other people have been posting you are able to post multiple photos uh, or videos to one post as well. Um, and 
so it's it's pretty uh relaxing even but it's it's comfortable to just kind of scroll through and check out everybody else's things it's very casual whereas facebook is kind of more corporate kind of more professional uh you know this is is very friendly and people post things you know they might just post a meme one day just a funny post and that's totally acceptable on instagram it's easy to like things as you see there uh, there's videos that you can add in. You can even create a TV link, essentially, uh, where you can post a video that's five or so minutes long, uh, and people who are scrolling through have the option to keep watching your video. Um, and that's pretty much the gist of what it's going to look like. I'm just kind of speeding up through my video here. You've got a section that shows you, you know, who likes your things, who's interacting with your posts um, and that's going to be kind of how it looks generally and i'll get more into into these things as well in a second um, so again it's fun it's casual uh, it's going to be more for interaction than it is for uh, promotion i would say and i'll get into that in a second as well um, you're able to engage with your community, right? So that's local and beyond around the world using hashtags again, uh, as, as Curtis and Ellen have mentioned on the others. Um, so you've got, you know, your ability to tag a photo and also search for tags. Uh, so for instance, here we've got um, the tag libraries of South Carolina. I can go through and see anybody else's post who used that tag as well. So here's one, um, I can click that photo because they used Libraries of South Carolina, uh, and I can go in and look at their caption and then look at their you know, tags. I could even click another one out of that, Libraries of Instagram, for instance, and I'll see libraries all around the world who have posted with the tag Libraries of Instagram and they'll come up. So if I were to post that in a, if I were to add that in my post, you know, my photo might end up in this big menu as well. Um, so pros and cons, right? So pros, it's easy to post, easy to like things. Um, your, your page can be aesthetically pleasing, which is a popular thing to do, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, it's easy to relate with younger audiences. So Gen Z is the largest user base of Instagram. Um, and then going, taking that a little bit further, 85% of teens will say that Instagram is their preferred social network. Um, it, that was of 2019. Uh, so, you know, it's super popular with people really 30 and below. Um, it's friendly, it's personal. You won't really have as many headlines like news articles or stories unless you choose to follow those things. So if you don't even, you know, subscribe to those in your feed, you won't see it. Uh, and then some negatives though, it's not reliable for promotional use again, because, because you can't at the bottom, you'll see there links and captions or posts are not functional. You can't really engage, you know, that call to action as Ellen was saying. Um, so that can be challenging. So you really think of it more as the gallery, like I said before. Uh, you're not able to post from desktop. Uh, because it was created to be a mobile app, it kind of still runs primarily on a mobile device. So that's your you know, tablet or phone. Um, so if you don't have a designated tablet or phone for your library or for your uh, you know, organization, you'll have to download it on your own personal device, um, which, you know, can be questionable sometimes if you want to do that. But, uh, and then the other negative there is that there is a one minute video length limit, unless you do that TV link that you saw briefly uh, earlier there. Um, so to create your account, again, you'll just download the app on your mobile device and you can get going, just follow the prompts. Uh, it is possible to create an account for your library without having a personal Instagram account. Um, I know on Facebook, Curtis was saying it does get a little kind of blurry, the lines between your personal Facebook page and your uh, business or um, organizations. Uh, 
your account handle, so the name of your account, uh, often will be will have acronyms or nicknames. Um, and then, not to worry though, the full name of your account will appear below the handle too, which is good. Uh, so let's see here. This is going to be one of my. I love this one. This is uh, an example here. This is Florence T Florence County Libraries Flow Teenscape. Uh, so this is their basically it caters to their YA uh, audience um, and you can see they're doing a lot of book recommendations they're doing a lot of graphics that uh, you know are bright and that cater to these younger audiences um, they have kind of a uh, you know look to them where the book is in the center and they you know have the same kind of caption of Miss Julie's book number 45, 44. They have the same theme going on there, which is helpful when you're trying to create a little bit of a brand for yourself. Um, let's see. So there they are again, just with their other book uh, recommendations. Another example is going to be Book Fairies of South Carolina. So this one's a cute one in, in talking about aesthetic of your account page. Um, you know, you notice that they have this little green uh, border around all of their posts. It kind of gives it a nice cohesive look. And again, you're able to post multiple photos within one post as well, which is useful. And then lastly, we've got Berkeley County Library System, just as another example. Uh, they do a really good job of kind of having fun with it, right? So that's going to be the point of Instagram is is to be friendly and, and have fun. So they are uh, really into this um, book face, hashtag book face Friday. Uh, it's basically a meme that, you know, people, you put your face in the back of a book, right? You're, you're the face of a book in front of your body, sure. Uh, and so you just post the photo. Again, it's fun. They're doing hashtag book face Friday. Uh, and we'll see another example here. Uh, so here's one, let's see. And so what you can do is you can click book face Friday and, you know, we'll see here in a sec, all of the book face Friday posts from around the world that people have done. I'll fast forward here a little bit. So they're all there. So it's fun to kind of engage with the world and anybody who's you know, you're kind of playing along with the rest of the world there, which is pretty fun. Um, so communication through Instagram, there are a lot of different methods, of course. Uh, there is the private private direct messaging option. Um, let's see, uh, you can do polls and quizzes and other things through your Instagram story, uh, which we can see right here. Oh, this is our, uh, our South Carolina State Library account, um, just kind of an example of what it looks like. So you can see that we have tagged other, uh, other organizations. So we shared uh, the Columbia Museum of Art, for instance. Um, we were able to share that and show uh, <laughs> Berkeley County. I'm looking at the <laughs> uh, chat here. Um, we were able to show, you know, shout out to other people. Uh, stories, you can, let me play those. Stories, you can add, these are going to be kind of live uh, little snippets that will erase in 24 hours. And you can do little quizzes, you can do uh, polls, um, you know, and just kind of have fun interacting with your audience uh, if they click it. So, you know, they can engage with you there. And those are just at the top there, as you see, scrolling by. So those are going to be your stories. It's a fun way to interact. And then your business insights, they're not as thorough as some of the other social media platforms, but they're useful still. So uh, here's our, our page. I just clicked a random uh, post at the time. And you can see it's going to show uh, how many visits came from that. So let's see. It's going to show how many profile visits came out of it and then how many people interacted with your, with your website and with your post. 
um, and then what percentage of those were, you know, where they were from. 39% um, weren't following the state library, but then, you know, they were able to see our things. So it's pretty interesting to play around with that information. And that's pretty much as far as it goes with, you know, kind of a basic understanding of Instagram. Um, and please, you know, reach out if you have any questions. I know I'm trying to uh, get through here. So we have some time for questions if you'd like, but um, yeah, that's, that's going to be your basic rundown of how Instagram works for sure. <laughs> Dana, and thank you to Ellen, and uh, thank you to Rufus. <laughs> um, we we still do have some time for questions. So there's Rufus. <laughs> he had to get his cameo in. He's very bad. So thank you, everyone, for putting up with him. <laughs> We've got one question that came in. What do you recommend as far as a budget for paid promotion, particularly on Facebook? We seem to hit a wall with organic outreach on our pages. Um, well, of course, you know, budget depends on, on what your organization is. And if you're trying to reach something local versus statewide, um, one of the things that we've done in the past, and to be honest, I don't do a lot of paid advertising on Facebook anymore. Uh, it just didn't really kind of get the reach that we needed. Um, whereas with radio or billboards or something like that, we, we actually get a lot more bang for our buck. Um, but uh, you have to kind of think of um, when you, set up everything, you know, what your demographics are, and you just have to play it by ear. If you are doing something that you have a time frame of one week on, if you're promoting a special event, um, then the, you know, $20 might be fine. If you're thinking about promoting over the whole year, um, maybe you want to budget $1,000, $500. It really just kind of depends on your size and your audience size. I know that was really general, sorry. Well, and Curtis, do you mind if I interject on that? And this isn't so much on advertising, but we were talking about this last week in our communications meeting. Um, one of the things that Twitter and Facebook are doing, because obviously they are in the business to make money, is that if you have a link in your post, it will not gain as much traction. It will not come up in feed as much because Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, they create their algorithms to keep those things further down because their thinking is if I click on a link in a post, that's going to take me off of social media and onto someone's website. And then I will not see the ads that are paying for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So you kind of want to get a little creative instead of putting a link like I just posted something this morning about a webinar that we have coming up uh, tomorrow. And I said, visit the events calendar on our website to register. So I used to post a link because you would think that makes life easier and you're doing the work for everybody. The only bad part is that then you're getting bumped down in feed and you're not getting as many eyeballs. I'm uh, responding to a question that just came through about uh, any suggestions on how to, oh no, how much time uh, do each of you invest daily or weekly? Um, and I was just responding that I probably, um, I probably only invest about 10 to 15% of my time. Um, some weeks it might be 25%, some weeks it might be 5%. Um, one of the things that I have to understand about social media is that it's very, um, go with the flow. And sometimes that's hard to deal with, but I just kind of get on there and, and just, um, you know, figure out what needs to be done. Um, and Ellen and Dana, maybe you can respond about how much time you spend per week or per day. I, I know for me personally, you know, I, I try to, you know, again, Hootsuite or any of these, uh, 
uh, scheduling and planning sites are very helpful where you can just spend um, some time on one, one day and get them all set up for the week. Uh, we're fortunate working in libraries, there's always something going on. So there's never, to me, a dull moment of like, oh, what to post, you know, it's very easy to um, kind of take a, a, an event or an article that's been published already and kind of highlight that. So that helps it go a little bit faster. Um, so I probably do about, I'd say, maybe a half hour max of my day, you know, engaging with people on Instagram and also posting myself and getting, you know, having my hashtags ready. And um, actually, this just reminded me that there is an uh, alternative text feature on Instagram now, which is a new feature. So um, working with that uh, takes a little bit of time. But yeah, you, you just kind of set aside a little bit of time. And it's fun to engage with people anyway. So <laughs> that's for me, I know. And I'm with Dana and Curtis. It, it's not a huge amount of time. Uh, and I'm like Dana, I like to kind of do things ahead of time when I can. Mm -hmm. And generally in the morning when I first get started so that I don't forget, I'll go ahead and do my tweets for the day. Um, also, some analytics have shown that Twitter gets the most traction first thing in the morning, at lunchtime, and at the end of the day. So when I'm scheduling my tweets, so if I have two, then I'll do one first thing in the morning and maybe at like four o'clock. If I have three, I squeeze one in there at lunchtime. Facebook, your main times are pretty much all day. But, um, but Twitter, it's a little bit more... Um, specific as far as when people are on there the most. Mm -hmm. I'd go ahead and try and get it done. And like Dana said, we have a lot of events going on. So, so that's great. But another thing is one of our employees at the library told me about a website called Checkaday, which is C-H-E-C-K-I-D-A-Y. And I can put it in chat here in a second, checkaday.com. It tells you what happened on this day in history or who was born on this day in history or some of the weird days like, you know, National Eat Your Veggies Day, things that you might be able to tie in. Some of them are kind of fun. So if you're desperate, go ahead and look there for some great ideas and, and you will definitely find them. Um, and as far as a team, because I saw in the, the chat down there, we will talk about social media plans when we meet together. And when we were back in the office, we met together formally once a month. Right now, while we're virtual, we meet once a week. And we'll talk about different things, but generally if there's something going on that needs posting, Curtis will see it first and he will tell Dana and I, um, can you guys put this on your sites? Or if one of us sees something, then we tell the other one. But having that teamwork makes a huge difference so that you can can get it all done and, and we kind of all think the same uh, so it, it helps just helping one another and that's a good point point. Um, and one of the things like alan said is we do meet as a very small team because we're in the same department but we do have a more broad agency-wide social media group and we try to meet quarterly so i posted in the chat uh, thank you for the reminder i need to set up that meeting soon <laughs> Um, another question was about budget. Um, one of the ways I get around that is I have a general promotions budget and if I need to pull out any social media advertising funds, I can do it out of that budget line because I don't have one that's specific just for social media advertising. Um, another question that came in, do you use different strategies for different platforms? Have you created a strategy guide in the past we don't necessarily have a strategy guide. We do have a media communications guide. And in that, in we, that we do talk about, talk about um, So there are some different things we talk about, what hashtags to use, things like that. But again, we keep it very general so that that gives each of us more leeway into how we can address certain situations or if a program pops up that we need to promote then we can do that in one specific outlet or we can do that among all of our social media outlets. And in terms of asking about upper management, getting them to, to buy in, that dis discussion comes up a lot in different PR conventions and conferences and things like that because 
a great number of agencies say, hey, I see that this is important, but my upper management doesn't get it. They love numbers. And so if you can use the analytics, which they're on there and, they, and they're not hard, if you can use those analytics to show them solid numbers, these are how many people we're reaching, these how, are how many people are interacting, this is where it's going, and it's only costing you this much to reach this many eyeballs, then you have a chance because they're numbers people and that does make a difference. Exactly, and one of the things as Ellen, as you were talking, um, <clears throat> the thing that uh, reminds me to use as a resource since a lot of us are, you know, local, federal, state, um, social media, there is a, um, there's a lot of information out there on government social media. And let's see, there's actually a blog called Social Media in Government. And it's part of, um, actually, this is just a posting, but it's part of Hootsuite. And I'll just share the uh, link right there, but you can get um, a lot of information about social media and government to kind of back up your case. All right, any other questions as we wrap up? It's about 1154. I know we've kept you for a long time, but hopefully we've given you a lot of useful information. Um, and again, you can certainly feel free to contact any of us individually. Um, and we'll be glad to uh, help you uh, with anything you're doing with social media. So uh, any other questions? I don't see any. Tiffany, do you have any, anything for a wrap up?